uh, for the funding set of the regulators, and it's from banking. Mike, this is from Washio. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks for uh, having us. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Asaf Manella, who's also from, from Washio. It's different from the rest of the papers that, that you see in this conference. Uh, but it is about regulation, as you can tell from the title. We're going to go after um, uh, the question of incentives in regulatory agencies. We got interested in this uh, after reading all these uh, you know, um, articles and, and um, all this, uh, the TV sh watching all these TV shows about uh, uh, different debacles and, and, and uh, disasters in different industries, for example, pharmaceuticals. Uh, offshore uh, drilling, um, the recent oil spill uh, is an example. Uh, obviously, a financial crisis of 2008. Um, and, and you can see that after each and every one of these episodes, there's a lot of scrutiny, there's a lot of discussion about um, incentives and abilities of regulators to actually do their job and regulate firms. Yeah, and we got interested in this because, um, from the research perspective, because there's basically no empirical research on incentive structures within the agency. Right? So there's a lot of discussions, there's a lot of hand waving, there's a lot of arguments and, and screaming, but there's no evidence. So we 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 start looking for for ways to uh, to look into this black box. And uh, we think we found a neat uh, laboratory to to do this. It turns out that that regulation is very often funded by fees paid by regulated firms. I I I, I heard a. Um, um, on NPR, a couple of months ago, they discussed this, uh, this system and they called it insane. So people, people think there are some potential incentive issues uh, related to this. Um, and it turns out also that this, um, this scheme is very common. It's all over the place across different sectors. You find it in pharmaceuticals, banking, oil and gas. You see it obviously um, uh, in um, yeah, antitrust aviation. And uh, so, and not just in the U.S., it's, uh, it's in, in, in many different countries. Right. Um, and there are a lot of good things about this system, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention a couple of them. Um, now, this is an important model of regulation to understand, regardless of, of uh, the topic of this particular paper, because it's so common. But for us, uh, it was interesting because we thought that uh, fees, variation in fees, may be useful in uncovering some um, incentive-related um, issues in uh, regulatory agencies. Right? Uh, for economists, obviously, it's not surprising that pay uh, may affect uh, performance and, and, and different regulatory issues. So that's where we started from, and we start looking into it. Right? And we start with a very basic question. Uh, do firms that pay higher fees uh, get a different regulatory issue? And I will, I will be very uh, precise about what I mean by different uh, in a minute. Yeah. Our answer to this question is yes. We use exogenous variation in, uh, in regulatory fees uh, in OCC and OTS. And we find that 1% increase in fees, bank level fees, uh, decreases the bank's regulatory capital ratio by about 2.3%. Uh, these are not percentage points, these are percent. So think uh, elasticities here. Um, it increases its expected loan losses by about 3.5%. It has dynamic effects in the sense that uh, the effects sometimes are long-lasting and they show up after, after a while. So for example, um, loan delinquencies increase after about seven to eight quarters. Uh, you see that uh, regulatory enforcement actions, it, the probability of, of enforcement action increases uh, after about three, three to five quarters. Okay? And there's some evidence uh, that closures decrease after five to seven quarters, and I'll talk about uh, about uh, explaining why they decrease. All right, so that's the summary of our main results. Uh, just quickly, uh, 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 where we fit in this in, in the literature. Uh, so there's a very nice paper by Agarwal et al. from Kami and QGE uh, that shows that uh, state charter banks are inconsistently regulated. Uh, by state versus uh, federal regulators. There are older papers uh, by Krosner and Strong uh, that show that industry affects regulation um, in, in the sense of regulatory capture. And um, they also show in a different paper that during the SNL crisis, regulators cap uh, <coughs> essentially dead thrifts alive by, by, by uh, influencing flow of private capital. Right. But uh, this paper, as far as we know, <coughs> excuse me, 
is the person to provide uh, causal evidence on the effect of funding schemes in regulatory agencies on the performance uh, of, of the regulators. All right, so just a quick overview of how banking regulation is structured or was structured before they closed OTS. Um, for, for many of you, this is not needed. This is actually needed for me because I always need this uh, list to kind of remember how things work. Uh, it's a very kind of complicated uh, structure. Uh, you don't see it in many uh, other industries. Banks uh, get to choose their charters, and so they get to choose their regulators. OCC um, is in charge of federally chartered national banks. National banks. OTS uh, was, before it got closed, uh, in charge of uh, federally chartered uh, thrifts. FDIC uh, or Fed. Uh, alternate with the state regulators, and they're in charge um, of uh, uh, state charter banks. Then uh, the Fed is in charge of uh, bank holding companies, and uh, FDIC has a backup authority, which I put in uh, uh, quotes. Maybe John uh, can explain to us what this means. Uh, the backup authority. All right. The way we see it is basically it steps in when uh, bad things bad things start happening. All right, so that's sort of the, the lay of the land. We are going to focus in this paper uh, on OCC and OTS. All right, so we're going to be looking at the, these two regulators and their relationships with, with federally chartered banks and trades. Right? Another fact about uh, regulation, which I, uh, so banking regulation, which I sort of mentioned, is that it's competitive in a very uh, weird sense. So uh, regulators compete over banks. All right, so uh, this is uh, OTS's uh, uh, head, James uh, Giller, in, 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 um, in an industry in 2003, holding a chain, so showing how they're going to cut through the Red Sea. Right? They, they, they try to attract as many banks as, as they can. Uh, the question is, why? Right? And we'll see the, the answer to it in a minute. Now, what do regulators do? Now, uh, uh, this is a very, uh, very rough way of, of, of explaining what regulators do. Right? But for our purposes, we're going to divide you know, what they do into routine supervision and uh, intervention. So when you think about routine supervision, it's sort of, uh, going there and making sure that the banks are not taking uh, too much risk and, and looking into their loan portfolios. Intervention is when you know, things happen and you need to do something. Uh, so you, you, you perform your regulatory actions. You close the bank community. Right? It's a very, very simplistic way to look at it. I used to be a regulator. Uh, a long time ago working for the antitrust and if someone would describe my job like this, I would be offended. <laughs> but for our purposes, for our purposes, th this will be enough, as you, you'll see uh, in the day. Now, uh, uh, what are these regulatory actions before I move on to, to our main uh, analysis? Uh, so my plot here, what we plot here is uh, failures and regulatory actions. Uh, the solid line is failures, sorry, actions, and uh, uh, the dashed line is failures. Right? You can see that the uh, regulatory actions, these enforcement actions, uh, they act sort of like um, ex post enforcement. Right? So they're not of this routine supervision. Um, you can also see that they tend to follow banking crisis. This will show up in, in our regressions later. Right? So why do they try to attract banks? Why, why do regulators compete over banks? Here's one of the reasons. Uh, fee income for these uh, regulatory agencies uh, comprises almost 100% of, uh, of their revenues. For both of them, both OTS and, and, and uh, the OCT. Okay? Uh, total costs are almost as, uh, you know, uh, are, are covered exa almost exactly by, by, by this fee income. An interesting part to me at least here was uh, this. Most of the costs are labor costs. So, so, you know, what this tells me is that there are very significant, potentially, uh, career concerns related to uh, the fee income. Right? If fee income is going to affect the size of the regulatory agencies, its ability to, to hire and retain people, because you know, the, the fee income if, if, there is, if, if, if there is a sharp uh, drop in the fee income, you would expect uh, you know, downsizing. Uh, you would lose your colleagues or not going to be able to hire new ones. So it's important, potentially, personally, for, for people working in the regulatory agency. 
So that's uh, that's the overview of the uh, of, of the of the uh, of this uh, system of regulation. Uh, now we wanted a very simple theoretical framework to just kind of fix ideas a little bit to understand how this this fee system is going to <coughs> is going to finish the effect regulation. All right, we looked it up. Uh, look up you know, what does government say about it? What is the motivation for why we have this uh, user fee system? Right? And you, you read things like this. Um, user charges are intended to improve the efficiency and the equity of financial financing certain government activities uh, so that it would decrease the burden on uh, the general taxpayer. And so that's the motivation for, for the existence of the system. Now this is great and this makes total sense, uh, although these benefits were not tested empirically in any way, or not analyzed theoretically um, all that much. But uh, it's not enough for us because we need to, uh, to think about incentives. What does this user fee system mean for the incentives of regulators? Right? So we're going to uh, come up with the simplest model we could, um, we could put together. Just again to fix ideas without theorizing too much before we move on to, to our regression. So here's how we think about it. There's a bank that maximizes its profits and out of fees. Profits are pi, uh, fees are F, fee, uh, for fees, F for fees, right? Um, Q is size and X is reach. Fees are determined uh, by the bank size, just like in the real uh, life, uh, the, bank, the fees that the bank is going to pay are going to be completely determined by, uh, by its size, right? Uh, the regulator is going to maximize so I did a function which we model in a very simple way uh, as just a difference between the fee income and some cost of regulation. And the cost of regulation uh, is going to depend on, on risk. So it may be uh, more expensive for the regulator either personally or uh, in monetary terms to regulate risky banks. Uh, it, it may depend on the size of the bank. It may be more expensive for the regulator to regulate larger banks uh, versus smaller banks, etc. Right? Now, this is a very simplistic way to, uh, to writing down the regulator's preferences. Right? Obviously, uh, regulators care about many other things, not just uh, the net, uh, net fee income. Right? I'm sure people care about actually doing their job and, and you know, decreasing, making sure that the risk um, is at, 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 um, at the right level. Right? Now, when we, look, when we work with more general preferences, we get more or less the same insights with much more you know, math that doesn't add much to the intuition. Uh, but as you, as you look at this, you just have in the back of your mind more general preferences where the regulator um, may care about other things and not just, not just the fee income. So we, we're not applying any, any vicious self-interested people. We're just saying incentives math. All right. Um, we're going to assume that there's an ash bargaining and the bank and the regulator are going to decide together what's going to be the level of risk the bank is going to take. Right, this, there's going to be this bad, and then there's bargaining with the bargaining parameter of beta. And uh, the question is now, where does this uh, bargaining power of the firm come from? Well, uh, the way we think about this is, you know, the firm could forego project, it can scale down in banking, uh, it can move assets uh, off balance sheet, thereby um, decreasing the fees that the regulator will get. All right, so those are not uh, hypothetical scenario, certainly not in this industry. Firms, um, firms can essentially take the fees away from the regulator. Right? So there's going to be some bargaining going on. If you solve this very simple model, you get something like this um, for the effect of fees on risk X. Right? So the elasticity of risk, whichever way you're going to measure it, I'm going to show you in a minute how we're going to measure it, uh, is, going to, uh, is going to be given by this ugly function. But if you look at what, what's in there, you see that um, the, the, the effect of fees on risk is going to be positive. <coughs> if risk increases bank profits and also increases regulator costs. So if it's costly for the regulator to regulate risk your bank and risk is profitable for the bank at that moment, the effect of fees on risk is going to be positive in this simple model. You can also see that there's some comparative statics here. Uh, treatment effect of fees is going to be bigger than bigger if uh, fees are large relative to the pay payoffs of, of the regulator, especially. Um, the regulator has very little bargaining power. 
and it's not very costly for the regulator to regulate a uh, riskier bank. So the regulator doesn't care as much about, about risk. So uh, the bottom line of this, of this little model is that the regulator dislikes risk, but fee income makes it uh, easier to swallow. And just one way to model it, we have different versions of, of this model uh, at, different, at different levels of complexity, but this is kind of just to fix ideas and, and, and show you guys how we think about this. All right, now, uh, here we're going to focus on this uh, prediction that under uh, relatively realistic uh, assumptions, the effect of fees on risk is going to be positive. Now, there, there are severe empirical challenges in testing these predictions. First of all, in this industry, at least, fees are completely determined uh, by size. So you can't separate in, in, uh, in the usual, uh, using usual empirical tests between um, the effect of size and the effect of fees. Any instrument that you'll find for fees is going to also move size, and you can't separate between the two. So that's challenge number one. Of course, there are going to be unobservable variables, as usual, that are going to be correlated um, with uh, size, risk, fees, and, and uh, different elasticities in this model. And we don't want to take this model too seriously with all these parametric assumptions, obviously. Not at this point. So we want to be more flexible and just test uh, this prediction that uh, the elasticity is going to be positive. So the solution we found is to, is to use this, um, this technique that, that became pretty popular uh, in applied micro uh, called regression case design. It turns out that the phi function is, is king. It's a piecewise linear function of size. So um, intuitively, uh, if the effect of size on risk measures is smooth, then the kings are going to identify the effect of fees, even though fees are completely determined by, by size. And I'm going to show you the, uh, the formal econometrics behind this, but that's the, the, the gist of, of, uh, of this technique. It's similar, in essence, to uh, regression discontinuity, which, is, uh, which, which perhaps is more familiar. Okay. There's going to be discontinuity, not in the level of fees, but rather in, in the first derivative. And that's what we're going to, we're going to exploit. And I'm going to show you um, exactly how this works. So, so we went ahead and we downloaded um, all these fee schedules going back 20 years. Uh, and this is how they look like. Now, um, that, that's sort of what, what the, the bank is facing. If your size is between zero and two a million dollars, you're going to pay this fee. If it's between two and 100, uh, two and 20, sorry, you're going to pay uh, a fee with a different slope until uh, the next kink point where the slope changes again. The function is uh, concave and piecewise, um, uh, piecewise linear. So um, just to kind of give you a, an idea of, of, of uh, the shape of this, Globally, and, and, and how concave is this? Uh, if you take an average bank and split it into two equal parts, the fee will increase um, by 17%. So, so each individual king is not dramatic if you look at it, but um, they, they matter for the regulator. Now, it was important for us because at first we looked at this and we thought this is trivial. It can be. Um, it can't work. But then when you start kind of looking at what this really means for the regulatory budget, you see that that's significant. So if you split the, as I said, the average bank in, in half, you get an increase in budget uh, of 17%. If you split the median bank in half, you get an increase in budget of about 29%. Right? Now, our estimates are going to come from uh, local bandwidth around Kings. So there, if you look around the, around the King, you also see that the Kings are important. Right, so if you look at the elasticity of, 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 of uh, fees with respect to this kings, right, one percent increase in assets is going to increase a uh, 0.17 percentage point. Uh, is, is going to increase with about 0.17 in, in uh, percentage points in fees. Right. What this means is that. Uh, <coughs> The equivalent of the first stage effect here is going to be about 22% uh, decrease in elasticity of fees to size as a bank moves from the left to the right of an average king. 
So how does this uh, technique work? I'm going to go over a couple of uh, slides with uh, some of uh, We built here on, on uh, Card et al, uh, a recent paper that sort of developed the formal econometrics behind this. Um, so we're going to start with a non-parametric function for risk. Right, as I said, we don't want to take our model too seriously at this point. Uh, this is a non-separable uh, function. The V here means the V function. V is the forcing variable, so size of the bank around the king. All right. Uh, the identifying assumption here that will make all this work is uh, that uh, there is smooth density. The density of the forcing variable of size around the king is smooth. Right? It's a more stringent assumption than you, what you would see in uh, regression discontinuity design. Uh, but it holds in our day. All right. Uh, then what's the treatment on the treated? Uh, it's going to be the partial derivative of risk with respect to uh, this B function, which is the phi function. So how do you measure it around the king? You know, you take the limit to the right minus the limit to the left, and divide it, like we usually do uh, in the by the equivalent of the first stage here, which is uh, the limit of the first derivative of the phi function to the right minus the limit of the phi function to the left. All right, looks. Uh, very similar to, to the usual estimator you would, you would see, except here we're working with slopes as opposed to levels. All right, so this is a slope of risk with respect to size to the right minus the same to the left, divided by the difference in the slopes of the phi function. And so this is going to pick up the effect of fees, the pure effect of fees, clean of uh, the effect of size. How we actually Estimated, so the previous slide was about identification. Estimation, uh, well, uh, Card et al. suggests to use uh, local uh, weighted polynomial regressions around the king. Uh, we experimented with a whole bunch of different uh, ways to actually estimate it. They, they, they all pretty, they're all pretty robust, and, and so we, we stick to, uh, to, to their prescription. So, what do you do? Well, uh, it looks very similar to a regression discontinuity design regression, except here um, the forcing variable. Uh, is, is interacted with with the king point. All right. So the effect is going to be estimated off of, of side. And P's here stand for polynomials in um, in the forcing variable, in the bank size. All right, so what's the treatment on the treated? That's the expression I showed you before, and that's the estimator. The estimator of uh, the treatment on the treated is going to be the beta 1 from, from, from the above regression divided by the uh, difference in slopes around the key. All right. So that's, that's the basic um, idea. Now, uh, in our case, things are a bit more complicated because there are multiple kings and they change over time. So while the uh, phi function is a deterministic function of size, it changes over time. And there are multiple kings all over the size distribution. Which is a nice thing for us because our results are not going to come from one local king, but they're going to come from the whole distribution of bank sizes, but it complicates matters econometrically. All right, so we adjust the methodology to, uh, to accommodate for time varying and, um, and uh, multiple kings. Uh, essentially what we do is we, uh, we uh, insert this uh, difference in uh, slopes inside the right inside variable and um, uh, recover the uh, treatment on treated directly from the regression as opposed to doing it in two stages like it's usually done. So, the prediction of the model is that under certain conditions, the effect of fees on risk is going to be positive. So, if we think of, for example, the capital ratio as a measure of the riskiness of the bank, what should we expect to see in the data? All right, so that's our kink, an average kink with this uh, change in slope on average for about 0.17. What should we expect to see in the data? Well, remember that the uh, change in slopes is negative because the function is globally concave. Right? So uh, before the kink, size is going to affect risk uh, in, in a certain way. After the kink, the uh, the regulator, according to the model, is going to allow higher risk to this band. And so you will see a flip in 
uh, in, in the slopes of the treated group, <coughs> excuse me, is going to see uh, an increasing line after the king. Right? Uh, it's not an extremely intuitive picture. And what makes it not intuitive is the fact that uh, the estimate from the regression includes uh, this delta, this change in slopes, which is negative. And so it flips the signs of the picture. Right? Uh, so, in, so instead of you know, the, um, the capital ratio is decreasing for banks that pay higher fees, the picture shows that they're increased. But this is because we just divided by a negative, um, negative variable. Right? Now, a very important thing about all these discontinuity techniques is that if they don't work in the raw data, it's going to be very hard to convince people that they work at all. Right? So this picture is crucial for us because we, we really need to see it in, in the raw data. So we're going to look at uh, the raw data. So these are capital ratios and uh, loan loss reserves. We residualize this data by regressing it on a, on, uh, on a non parametric function of size. So these are residuals of risk measures um, on size. And then we, we, we put these residuals in, in, in buckets and plot them against uh, the kings. And so you can see that the raw data more or less agrees with this, with this prediction. So you see a decreasing slope in capital ratios prior to the king and an increase um, after the king. The long loss reserves work in the opposite direction and the capital ratios, right? So the long loss reserves are a measure of uh, the riskiness and capital ratios measure of safety. All right. So uh, let me move on to, uh, to the regressions. This is uh, regular three capital, leverage ratio, tier one risk based ratio, and uh, total risk based ratio. And these are already adjusted uh, estimates of treatment on the treated, um, as, as, I, as I showed them to you before. Now, uh, what you see here is uh, the elasticity of, of risk uh, in decreasing in, in fees, right? as, uh, as I promised to you before. The uh, leverage ratio, so the capital ratio, the tier one risk based capital ratio, and total risk based capital ratio are all decreasing uh, in, in fees. <coughs> These effects are very uh, robust. They're not um, sensitive to uh, polynomial degrees, they're not sensitive to a particular kernel that we choose for the regression. Um, so we, we were not able. Uh, to kill them, no matter uh, how we try. But if if if, uh, if you have any suggestions, we'll we'll try them too. Another thing, the next thing we did, we looked at uh, loan loss reserves. So let me start with with uh, these two mil uh, columns here. These are loan uh, loss reserves divided by loans. You can see, just as the picture that from the raw data uh, promised, um, there's uh, there's an increase. In the risk of loans in the bank portfolio as a function of the fees it pays. All right, again, uh, consistent with our model, the interpretation of this is that regulators are going to allow banks to take more risks if those banks are paying higher fees. All right, a, a very interesting sort of, sort of uh, the dog that didn't bark here uh, is uh, the lack of the result for non current loans. So these are loans that are already not performing very well. And we don't find anything interesting here. That got us thinking about uh, dynamic effects. I can think about this. If fees, if, if higher fees mean that the regulator will allow banks to take more risks, that will kick in the performance of the loans only after a bunch of, uh, after a while, right? So it will take some time, eventually several quarters, until this increase in riskiness will actually show up in our data. So we need to adjust our estimates for these dynamic effects, we need to adjust the methodology again uh, to accommodate dynamic effects, right? So the regulation, just in general, may have dynamic effects, may take time to kick in. Also, more troubling for our estimates, fees today may affect the instrument several quarters from now, right? So, for example, if uh, the regulator will allow banks to take more risks, this will increase size, and this will in turn influence the position of the bank relative to the kings in the future. Right, the static estimates are going to miss this, which potentially will lead to misspecification. 
So uh, we use, um, again, the uh, regression discontinuity techniques that were developed for, for this kind of dynamic effects. Celine and all have a very nice uh, QG paper recently uh, doing this for uh, school district expenditures. It's easy to apply um, this uh, stuff in our setting. Uh, we're going to estimate the intent to treat effect and the treatment on the treated uh, in, in a dynamic setting. Essentially, we're going to allow a shock today to affect outcomes in the future, and we're going to separate uh, the total treatment effect, this intent to treat effect, from the treatment on the treated effect, from uh, you know, the shocks in, 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 in specific quarters. Right. Um, so we estimate this big regression that um, spits out the intent to treat and the treatment on the treat. And the intent to treat is going to be the total effect of fees and outcomes over, uh, over many points. How many? Uh, Ten minutes. Ten minutes, great. All right, so let me show you the results from the uh, dynamic regressions. First of all, on, on the same measures of risks that we looked uh, and before, I do the capital ratios. It turns out that the effect of fees are not dynamic in the sense that uh, they kick in immediately. This is the treatment on the treated, and they don't show up um, in the future. So all of the effect of fees on leverage ratios is realized immediately, and there is no lingering effect that I was worried about before. All right, it all it all gets realized. I mean, you can see it also in the intent to treat uh, picture. These are estimates uh, over quarters. All right, it's it's basically flat. Right. Loan loss reserves show a very similar result. The effect of uh, fees on the loan loss reserves are positive, as we saw before in the treatment of the, the static setting, and they drop to zero. Um, almost uh, immediately afterwards, after a couple of quarters. So again, the effect of fees on this measure of risk, right, the measure of the riskiness of the loan portfolio, is also um, contemporaneous and, and short lived so, so we should be confident you know, with using the static framework for this variance. Now, the non-current loans that didn't work previously in the static regression work here in the dynamic regression. <coughs> Right. So as I said, you know, the, the effect of fees today will kick in the, the poor loan performance only several quarters from now. As you can see here, in the intent to treat, this total effect, right, it spikes uh, after about seven quarters. You can also see it on the treatment all the treated. For each individual quarter, you see the spike after about seven quarters. So just like we, uh, we were worried before, the dog that didn't bark regression, where the uh, non-performing loans didn't work in the static side, and because it takes time for the effect to get realized, um, you can see that they, uh, the, the fees affect this measure of risk after about seven, seven to eight quarters. Enforcement actions that I showed you before also didn't work very well in the static regression, but they work in the dynamic regression. So what you see here is that about three to five quarters after the shock, after the increase in fees, uh, there's an increase in the probability of an enforcement action. How do we interpret this? Well, you know, we say the risk seems to uh, catch up with these banks. So the regulator at this point allows the bank to take more risks, and it takes some time until those risks materialize at which point the bank has a high probability of getting in trouble, at which point the regulator needs to act. Right. We find uh, weaker results for failures. Um, they are rare, and uh, we're not very surprised that we didn't find very strong results for them. But still, um, there is a decrease in the probability of failure about seven uh, five to seven quarters after the shock. Now, this is surprising. Uh, you know, why, why would there be a decrease in the probability of fake? But the way we think about this, at least uh, uh, now, is that the regulator may be more reluctant to close banks that pay higher fees. 
Right, there's some evidence for this in the literature. Um, there's a lot of innuendos and hand waving about this in the literature. Um, and so this is consistent with that, with that line of reasoning. All right, the regulator is going to be reluctant to, to close high fee pain veins. Okay. Uh, that being said, the caveat here is that the results are not extremely strong, so we're still working on, on figuring out what's going on. In particular, this regression doesn't, con doesn't condition on the crisis period, so it's not particularly, you know, it doesn't use the data um, uh, fully just yet. All right. Any uh, comment? Let me, okay, so one more thing that I want to mention. Um, in this discontinuity regressions, it's very, very important to make sure that your results are not particularly sensitive to the bandwidth um, around, around the discontinuity point. Right, this is not just another robustness test. For this kind of applications, uh, this is pretty central. So we've got, yeah, it was very important for us to, 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 to check what happens when you start shrinking uh, the window around each key. And so what you see here is that uh, as we move towards zero around the key, you know, at zero obviously the estimates are going to explode, but they're getting smaller um, as, we, as we get closer. Uh, to the king. So the magnitudes of the estimates increase as we get closer to the king. And they decrease as we get further away from the king where um, this, this uh, break in the slopes is less important. All right, so that again is consistent with the rest of the findings uh, that, that, that I showed. Obviously, again, as we decrease the bandwidth to, to the minimum, the variance is close. Let me skip this. I'm going to uh, conclude. So, what we identify here is the what we call the leniency for for fees channel. Okay. Um, banks that pay higher fees are going to face uh, softer regulation, in the sense that the regulator will allow them to uh, lever up more. The regulator will allow them to hold riskier loans, and the banks are more likely to get in trouble. Um, down the road. We want to emphasize that the main trade-offs that we identify in this paper are not specific to banking. Banking just uh, gives us a great laboratory to, to study this issue. But th this um, leniency that increases the firm size and therefore regulatory budgets um, is everywhere. You see it in pharmaceuticals, you see it in aviation, you see it in mining, drilling, and all those other places. So, so, so the framework that we put forth here is applicable in those other settings too. In fact, uh, given that the data on regulatory budgets is available, it's very easy to test uh, this framework elsewhere. The, um, the user fee model, uh, and then that's kind of like, the uh, call for research in some sense. The user fee model has not been researched um, uh, nearly enough theoretically. It was very hard for us to find a framework that would uh, analyze this model directly. Given its importance and given the fact that it's all over the place, uh, it would be great to have a more um, robust theoretical frameworks uh, to understand how those things work. Right? In, in fact, we, we, we barely found any discussions of, uh, of this issue um, in the academic field. All right, that's all I have. Thank you very much. First discussion. Discuss of the Jean Bowrich from the FDIC. Paper. Thank you for writing a cool paper to discuss. <laughs> Kathleen and I um, coordinated our slides a little bit so that we hope we don't have too much overlap as a result and we can maximize the amount of time that we have. Um, as 
many people have done. I need to give a little disclaimer that these views are my own and do not reflect uh, any views necessarily of the uh, FDIC. Okay, so I'll do a quick overview of the paper. Uh, Ronnie obviously discussed it, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. The basic premise is that regulators have their own incentives, in particular to collect fees. Um, how do fees then affect the outcomes of regulated institutions? So one question, you know, as a first step of this is, at least in the common discussion, some of the discussion, at least in the popular press, is about size and as much as it might be about fees, revolving door kind of issues, uh, regulatory capture, being cozy with uh, the regulated institutions. It's not always clear to me how much in that popular press really is about fees specifically rather than size. I think a very cool identification strategy, but it's really only talking about the first part, not the second. Um, used banking, it's a good example. It's topical, obviously, for a place like this. It's a good setting. Uh, we have good data for it, so uh, it's nice in that way. General, generalizability, so we spend a lot of time uh, trying to say this is a general user fee model. Though in the motivation, you talk about um, competition. And that's really something that may be unique to banking. And I'm going to spend some time talking about uh, regulatory competition within banking, and I don't know other industries well enough, but how much of these effects are really specific to banking because of that regulatory competition that may not be generalizable outside, and of course other research, uh, as you called for, uh, might be able to speak to that. So they use this key in the thing structure. Really, really cool idea. Um, I only recently learned about this uh, regression kink, this continuity. I've seen, I've seen like four papers in the last few months. It's a cool methodology to get at this. And it gives you a pretty high level of confidence, some, some of the pictures and his result, that there's clearly a, an effect that they're, they're getting from this. Um, there's no natural reason to expect kinks all, all over the place if they're not related to this kind of fee structure that you have. So I think there's a lot of cool stuff in the paper, and most of what I'll be talking about in Kathleen is about how do we interpret some of this stuff, what are some of the institutional factors they might want to consider, and Kathleen will go more into some of the empirics. Um, and their conclusion is that higher fees cause more risk taking, uh, also less oversight. Um, I have that as a question mark, and Kathleen's going to get to that a little bit. I don't always know how much the measures are reflecting one versus the other, or both. Okay, so the first question is, what is the mechanism here? So uh, I'm going to give an example from uh, how OCC's the OCC regulates uh, community banks in particular. Most of the observations that you have are going to be community banks. So let me just walk through. Most of the OCC banks are fairly small, even though they regulate the big ones. Um, this is how their examination process works. There's, there's an examiner in charge. Um, and for, at least for community banks, they're overseeing multiple banks. They have a number of responsibilities. They have to identify the risk of the bank. They're going to recommend appropriate supervisory strategies, like these enforcement actions. Uh, they have to keep their supervisory staff informed of any uh, conditions ongoing at the bank and they have to maintain an examination schedule. Where along this process do we really expect the problems to be? Do we think that the uh, examiner knows the fee schedule and is somehow not identifying the risks at the bank because the, he's got this fee schedule in mind? Or do we think that there's something about the communication along the way that's changing this? Or do we think that there's something about the way that they schedule the exams that's causing the problem? The fee schedule means that they don't improve as many exams at the banks where there's the higher fees. Um, some of this you might not be able to separate out, at least on the last one, maintaining the examination schedule. There is data on that. It's regulatory data, so you have to talk to someone in a regulatory institution. Um, <laughs> but that, there, there is something that you might be able to do on this one, at least. Another issue that you brought up that's relevant is that there's these overlapping regulatory authorities. So FDIC has backup regulatory authority for all uh, depository institutions. Loosely speaking, what I understand that to mean is that we're sitting in those meetings too. If we think that you're taking on a lot of risk, even if we're not your primary federal regulator, we get to speak up, do enforcement actions, etc. Federal Reserve Board also has uh, regulatory authority over all bank holding companies, um, in which case if there are some bank holding companies that also are getting this Federal Reserve supervision, uh, you might think that these effects that you're finding for the OCC and OTS might be different if you have these additional um, layers of regulatory supervision. You could do some kind of test on members of bank holding companies around the kink. I'm not sure that you'll get a lot out of that, but it's something that you might, worth, might be worth considering. Um, you talked about regulatory competition. We have these four, or sorry, 
three now and used to be four regulatory agencies. Um, they're state chartered banks. State chartered banks are regulated either by us, the FDIC, or the Federal Reserve Board. Thankfully for your paper, your concerns about fees don't apply to us or the Fed. We don't collect fees on the basis of how many banks we supervise, neither does the Fed. OTS and OCC banks, their fees do depend on how many banks they supervise. Um, from a paper that you, you uh, quote also, they say that the, uh, they, they recognize that this regulatory competition might be bad, and the importance of the cost and decision about which charter to, to choose, the smaller number of banks, and special burdens of examining large and complex organizations are maybe a driver of some of the, the misincentives in regulation. But I really think that competition is an important part of the story that you talk about in the introduction, but you could spend a little bit more time trying to develop what competition means in the setting and how much that's driving any of the results that you're getting. The OTS, for example, used to call banks their customers, um, which doesn't bode necessarily well for good supervision. Um, there's a story of Countrywide. So Countrywide was a member of the OCC. Loosely speaking, um, maybe the OCC started coming down a little bit hard, they jumped ship to OTS, um, Office of Trip Supervision, but then ended up as part of Bank of America. Golden West got uh, acquired by Wachovia, and then WAMU was the last standing large thrift operated by OTS. Um, and there's, Sheila Bear has in her book the discussions around actually being able to fail WAMU. FDIC was pushing pretty heavily for it relative to, um, say, OTS. Uh, there is a paper from the Fed that says that banks, when they switch charters, seem to get improvements in their, um, their supervisory ratings that is worth looking at in this context. But because of this regulatory switching, there was a concern that people were jumping ship to get favor from banks, or favor from regulators, and a financial institution letter in increased those barriers to switching. They said if your account is three, four, or five, so you're a risky bank, then uh, you need approval from the FDIC. You need a lot more approvals to be able to just switch charters. And charter switching overall is, is more discouraged after this letter. Without thinking about competition, you can't really analyze what the effects of this might be. So it might be interesting to try and think how competition plays a role in the story and then maybe look at changes around this. OK, so how am I on time? Five minutes? OK. Um, so in the paper, uh, and, or at least in the, converse, in the conversation today, uh, you're talking about the fee schedule being related to size. But it actually, in fact, is also related to risk. And you talk about this a little bit in the paper, because the way that fees are related to risk doesn't differ around that kink. So even though this is something that I think you might want to take a little bit more care on, it's something that um, there's no natural reason to expect variations around the kink resulting from this, but it does, it does require a little bit more thought, I think. Um, so you have the kinks based on size, but then the OCC, this is pulled uh, from their website, uh, they have additional surcharges for riskier banks. Uh, and that's to ensure that fees uh, reflect the increased cost of supervision, the the institutions that are rated three, four, five, so the riskier rated uh, institutions. And even beyond that, we as the FDIC have a risk-based deposit insurance pricing system. So around that kink, if you're gonna suddenly start taking on more risk, it's not uh, unassociated with increase in your costs. You are paying more fees, either from the OCC or from us, the FDIC. And especially as you get to some of those higher kinks, these additional fees could potentially overwhelm the elasticities that you're getting at the higher kink. So for example, if, you're a, uh, if you go from a Camels 2 or 3, that's an increase in your uh, deposit, in deposit insurance assessment rate of three basis points. That's an equal order of magnitude of your average fee um, for, for most of the banks in your sample. Going from a 3 to 4, you're increasing 18 basis points. So going around those kinks, if you're going to be taking on more risk, it may come at quite a price. And this actually brings me to another sort of concern about, uh, another uh, question about how we think about the results in the paper. Are we concerned about bank risk per se, or are we concerned more about poor regulation and the mispricing of the bank risk? 
Are you worried that uh, banks are just taking risk, or are you right, worried that the banks are taking risk with, without being charged for it? If it's the former, and it's just bank risk, and they're being charged appropriately, the concerns about overall efficiency of the process are different than if we think of the problem as being that banks are taking risk, and then we're not capturing it and not charging them for it. In particular, the finding of your paper is that high risk, you get high risk from the high fee banks. Isn't that kind of a good thing? If regulation serving its purpose well, shouldn't the high-risk banks be getting a higher fee charged to them? So the, there is a bit of concern about efficiency because this is, if we, this, this is what we would, we would want. And um, when, when we think about what the, whether or not there are problems as a result of the fee-based structure, um, this is important to keep in mind, is that that's actually what we want as an outcome, that high-risk banks pay high fees. What I really want to know, and of course you need access to some of this information, um, is given your risk choice, is there a kink in the assignment of these camels ratings? So is it that banks are taking more risk and then regulators aren't assigning them a higher, uh, a higher regulatory, or a more risky regulatory rating? Uh, so I have a couple slides on theory. I probably will only get to one, uh, which is fine. Uh, this is your Nash bargaining uh, framework. And I wanted to talk about a couple of the implications. Um, you get some really nice implications, this trade-off between risk and fees that um, you know, there, there's uh, some literature and some thinking about that I'm, I'm sympathetic to. One of the unfortunate implications of Nash bargaining, though, again, going to the efficiency standpoint, is that there's no inefficiencies in Nash bargaining. You have the pie, and you're just deciding how to split the pie. There's no problems created from this uh, kink schedule. And so if we're going to think about your model as a good representation, Nash bargaining is just how we divide a pie. It's not about um, inefficiency, which I think is kind of the underlying concern within this paper. The other question is um, whether or not we're thinking about the problem is dynamic or static. In the paper, you have a lot about uh, dynamics and the empirical section. But when we think about it conceptually, I think it's also important to think about what the dynamic component might be. The failure of a high fee bank is really costly <coughs> to a regulator. Talk to the OTS. Well, you can't because they don't exist anymore because all of their banks failed. So if we want to think about uh, allowing banks to take too much risk, if there's no other competition story in there, if I'm just a regulator with this fee structure, I really don't want those high fee banks or those high fee institutions that I regulate to get into too much trouble because they're the ones that I collect the fee from. In fact, it's the opposite. If, I, if I'm the only game in town, I want to make sure that I collect as much from them and give them as little leeway to, to, to get out of the business. So in the context of the theory, it might be important to think about. And I'll uh, kick it off to Kathleen with this final point, which is that the OCC chooses its fees. So because the OCC is choosing its fees, that gets into some of these other questions. And if the FCC, if the OCC can choose its fees, what you would get from a model like this is a constant elasticity. Why? Because we evaluate the dollar the same way. It's a dollar for you or a dollar for me, but it doesn't really affect anything about your, the risk choice that we would have. Um, so because the OCC can choose its fees, there's a little bit of concern about causality, but I still think there's a lot of really cool stuff there given that can structure, and now I'll hand it off to Kathleen. Thank you, John. So he has um, more that we can talk about here. I'm not going to go through the methodology because it's clear that this is a time-sensitive group here, and I'm standing between you and whatever you want to do with the rest of your weekend, so I'll move on. Uh, the paper, I think, is somewhat mm -hmm new is my impression is that it's in it's uh, so understanding where this data came from could be really important so I encourage you to flesh this out a bit and I want to talk a little bit about the kinks um, I, I'm not sure where the data set came from I, I, I assume that you're taking the fees and then looking it up on where you would fit on those schedules you're not getting from the OCC where they fit do you know so well we can talk about it when we get there but I, I didn't know you said it was a novel data set I, I don't know what the data set actually is and so um, I tried to replicate as much as I could so we'll see what, what I can do all right so uh, in the paper he didn't mention this in the paper he says that kinks 1 3 and 9 are the most important kinks 
for the results. Um, and so here's the elasticities from the paper for those three kinks, and you can definitely see that kinks one, three, and nine are quite uh, large with those elasticities. So I want to explore these kinks a little bit more and where they might come from. So uh, there isn't any information in the paper on how many banks are in each of these kinks, but they're in the smallest and the largest, and then there's one in the middle. So I want to know, are there really nine kinks, so to speak? And are, how many observations are above and below their bandwidth, which is 0.3 log points? Uh, I just want to, I'm not going to go into it, but there may be overlapping bandwidths at, that, at those long, log points. So you might want to just split, we can talk about it later, but you want to make sure that you have no overlapping bandwidths. Uh, and what happens to the number of observations when you start to narrow these bandwidths down? Uh, do you have enough to make any assertion? So I did this an extremely crude method, okay? So I downloaded uh, all banks from this data set called US Bank Locations, which I found on the web. Um, I don't know if the OCC or the OTS uh, oversees any of these banks, but I'm going to make some crude assumption that the distribution of banks at each of these kinks represents, to some extent, the distribution of banks that the OCC and the OTS supervise. Okay? So uh, I, I made the 0.3 log points on either side of the kink using these banks. Uh, and you can see, remember, kinks 1, 3, and 9 are the ones that have the most power. You can see in kink 1, there's hardly any. Kink 9, there's hardly any. And 9s are really large banks, OK? And most of the banks are in kink 3. So you know, having some more information on why are these kinks, why is kink 3 so important? And maybe throwing out kinks 1, and maybe, frankly, throwing out if this is true distribution of what's around the kinks, OK? You know, 7, 8, 9 just not enough power, I'm, I think, to really get some estimate of the effect of the kink on the outcome variables they have. Now, the fact they do get, as they do get a, um, a result is extremely fascinating and, and, and why is even more important. So I'm not sure whether there's enough power in kinks 1 and, and frankly, after kinks 7 to do any kind of testing here. Uh, and particularly since you do robustness and narrow it even more, there are so few in 9 and 1 that you would lose them all. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to go through this because he already mentioned their findings, uh, which are really important. But I want to talk a little bit about interpretation. How should we interpret these findings? So, for example, the loan loss reserve uh, to loans is higher above the kink. And that is evidence of more risk taking. But is it really? Could this be more prudent accounting? So you're putting aside more reserves versus loans, and so therefore, in fact, that's more of a safety measure than it may be a risky measure. So that's one. And in, and in particular, the, the estimate of loan loss reserves over non-current loans is insignificant, which may be evidence that they are putting aside sufficient reserves for the type of loans that they have. Uh, is this risk-taking or regulatory leniency? They're sort of used interchangeably in the paper, but when you get to things like corrective action, you can actually get opposite ex-ante predictions over whether it's risk-taking or regulatory leniency. So if you think about um, failure, for example, if you're lenient, you're not going to fail a bank, which is uh, what you might find, and you're not going to have much corrective action. But if it's risk taking and the bank is actually going to do something, I mean, the, and the regulator wants to do something, you might see more corrective action and more failure. So I think trying to parse out risk taking from leniency may be important uh, in understanding better the incentives that the regulator might have. Okay. Uh, he mentioned, uh, Ronnie mentioned very briefly the crisis, but there was also uh, FIDUSHA that John pointed out to me went into effect. Also, in about the same time as the first crisis that he looked at, and so perhaps sub looking at those two time periods separately would be useful. Maybe a lot of this action is happening around these regulatory chains and around the crisis, and so how much of that uh, is 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 uh, driving your results? I'm not sure. You could also look at banks that made lots of MBS or C and D loans, for example, uh, to see whether or not. Uh, those also exhibited kinks around, around the kinks as well to try to, to look at, risk, at banks that might be riskier in general to see whether or not then they got more lenient treatment or whatever 
uh, you want to look at there. And then I want to talk about, of course, <laughs> no, no good discussant in empirics doesn't say something about endogeneity. It's the free space on discussant bingo. Nobody gets any points for it, okay? Um, but it has to be said. Uh, and, you know, using the kink design is supposed to overcome some of this endogeneity. Recent paper by Hennessy and Strebula, or if I say that wrong, uh, suggests that you can't do, basically can't do research, but be that as it may, uh, you know, this is just something, I'm not sure I agree with this thought that you need to know something about the policy generating process to actually think this kink type of analysis is exogenous, right? So the, the kinks are not exogenous to some extent, but the regulator chooses them. Um, the fee structure, they don't actually change the kinks at all, so they don't do that much of that. But they argue that unless the policy transition or the change in fees is uh, completely exogenous or unknown, then you can't determine causality. But of course, uh, you know, now I'm just even more depressed as an empirical researcher because I don't think anyone can ever overcome endogeneity anymore. But to give you a flavor for this, is this is sort of the change in the minimum fee from 1998 to 2014. So the green line is inflation. You mentioned in the paper that the change in fees was due to inflation. But you can see the change in fees for the lower end, particularly those around the kink, which has the most uh, most pronounced uh, effect in your sample, the change in those fees are actually the highest, or some of the highest, okay? So regulators may be adjusting those fees for some of the things that you're seeing here, and to know more about the policy generating process would be useful in determining, uh, you know, what are the incentives of regulators, okay? And so I'll leave you with this last, do I have one more? Yeah, I'll leave it with this last point again with endogeneity, um, that regulators, banks may endogenize the king structure into their behavior. There's a paper by Peter Ilyev who looks at SOX 404 compliance and shows that when uh, firms are about ready to hit the $75 million threshold, they try to manage their public float so they won't have to comply with auditor attestation. Be interesting to know whether or not around that kink three, because you show that size does not vary around the kink. So you do show that, but around kink three, whether or not there's some managing of assets which has to be easier to manage than public float, uh, so they don't have to pay the higher fee. Okay? It's because you said you did mention that fees were significantly higher for the one bank that went over than two banks on on uh, than if you split the bank in half, right? And so banks may want to go ahead and pay a lower fee. Right? So you might want to look at that. And so in conclusion, uh, John and I together you know, uh, agree that this is an extremely interesting paper. There's clearly something there. So there is definitely uh, some type of behavior change around these kinks. We don't disagree with that. We just want to give you some ideas to try to tighten it up, maybe uh, add some more generalization to it. Um, and to take some of these into consideration. And because I have a captive audience for people who like regulation, uh, I want to put in a plug, I have permission to do this, put in a plug for our SEC conference, which will happen on May 1st. Jennifer and Russ are co-organizers along with me uh, on this. Uh, and so we are just putting together the, the papers that will be on this program, and I hope that you will consider attending. It'll be at SEC headquarters, which is a lot of fun to go and visit. Um, and so we would welcome you if you would like to do that. So thank you. Any response first? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, great discussions. Uh, excellent, really, comments. Uh, so, uh, a lot, lot of stuff to think about. Uh, I want to mention briefly a couple of things, and then we may talk about other uh, stuff flying. So, uh, competition, we don't do much about it, that's true. Our regressions, however, take care of a lot of this. Um, what I think we should, and I'll tell you in a second how, but uh, what I think we should do is really look at the cross section. And so, um, remember these regressions uh, have time effects, quarter effects in them, and that also gets to some of the inflation concerns uh, and adjustments. Uh, there are um, time effects and kink effects on regulator specific effects. So one of the things we find is that there is no, once you do this, 
there is no difference in effect across regulators. And um, this is consistent with uh, the Sagarwal et al. paper also that they find that this time dummies and um, uh, this kind of frameworks efficiently control for this chart, chart error shopping uh, issues. Now, uh, this is not enough, and I agree that we should look, uh, we should look more into the competition. Uh, so, uh, do regulators pay attention to kinks, or uh, uh, I, we, we don't think they do, uh, not according to our tests. Uh, what we identify here is not the effect of kinks, but rather the effect of uh, fees. Right? So, so it's very important. This regression is going to pick up the effect of fees, not the kinks. Uh, so it's not like the regulator is sitting there and looking, oh, where is this bank? Is it to the left of the king or is it to the right of the king? Right. This methodology, if you agree that the density is smooth around the kink, is going to pick up the effect of fees. Um, I, I, uh, excellent comment about uh, looking at uh, additional layers of supervision, like uh, bank holding companies. We will do that. That's actually uh, together with the competition is, is uh, on our to do list. Um, the uh, regulator will have disutility for risk uh, for high fee paying banks. So that's already in the model, right? So the regulator hates risk, so to speak. It's just uh, uh, fees make it more palatable, uh, but uh, you know, that's that's uh, yeah, that's essentially where the predictions are coming from. Um, all right. Uh, they they rarely change uh, the, the schedules, as you know, and uh, we believe that our strategy controls effectively for for the inflation issues. Those are very important. We ran some simulations. Uh, and uh, we really find that not doing this properly screws up the results completely. So, uh, so I think there we're, on, um, uh, we're okay. Uh, how many banks are on the King? So the results are coming from uh, King 3, King 9, not so much from King 1. Um, once you start uh, looking within Kings, uh, you start losing power. Um, you know, uh, King 3 works separately uh, from all the other Kings. King 6 and King, king 9 work, so, but you know, Obviously, as you said, as you move on to, and so we we'll lump them all together, and so our methodology uh, effectively uh, controls for differences across kings, and we estimate a single effect for all the banks uh, across the spectrum. Um, yeah, so uh, we, we can talk about that. I don't want to spend too much time. Excellent comments. I could talk more. Yes. Uh -huh. So imagine that I'm a bank, and I decide for whatever reason to take a lot more risk. Because I'm taking a lot of risk, uh, I grow faster, you know, like I'm just taking higher leverage or something, and if there's good outcomes, I'm gonna grow really fast. When I grow really fast, I go, I blow past my current <coughs> fee schedule to the next stage. So the next stage, uh, when the bank supervisor comes in, you have a higher fee, you're bigger, and you're riskier. Uh, but all of this was because the manager, two periods ago, decided to go nuts. Um, is the is the kink discontinuity approach able to handle that that scenario? How not the static framework, but the dynamic framework? Yes. So so the dynamic framework is going to measure this ITT effect, this intensity tree effect, which includes the effect of current uh, fees, the location around the kink, on your future locations around the kink. So if today you took risks, and then you know that because of that you grew, and that influenced your position relative to the kink. In the Future, this will be counted for uh, in the dynamic regression. In the static approach, it will not. So this is always so this is always a concern uh, in this discontinuity uh, in the, this discontinuity studies. Does it make sense? Does it answer your question? Just a bit. I'm not so familiar with the kids. So uh, like basically, what it means is so. So essentially, what the uh, dynamic regression does, it estimates both the effect of uh, so it estimates the effect of the current king this quarter on your position around the kings in the future quarters. So if there's, effect, if, there, if there's effect of the instrument on future sizes, this will be estimated in this intensity uh, regression. This is a model, sorry, we, we, can, we can chat about this. Yes? You mentioned that, that, that there's other applications for this you know, outside of the banking area, and of course, you know, my mind goes towards self-regulation, which is a totally different animal than a government so you know, I would wonder, you know, how does this how does this um, really apply to self-regulation? You've got a lot more conflicts of interest at hand um, in that 
space, and is, is it does it make a much more complicated model, or is it or is the outcome a lot more um, obvious um, because it is a self-regulator? Um, <coughs> right. Yeah. And, and and you know, special um, there's a lot of self-regulators, obviously, in the, in the broker dealer space. Some of them do deal with risk. Some of it is pure trading violations. But um, one self-regulator that's um, almost all risk is central clearing. So um, the, the is. You know, is this an issue in central clearing where um, their entire, you know, they've got to deal with the risk of the, um, the clearing agency, uh, which depends on clearing members, and the clearing members effectively own the clearing agency, or some of them. Yeah, some I mean, of this, this, is the, this is an amazing question. I don't know. Uh, that's my short answer. I'll spend a lot of time thinking about it. Uh, I, I, I don't know much about self, uh, self regulatory agencies. I don't know enough to answer this question right now. So, so we focused on, on, on government regulation. But I think this is a fascinating thing to look into. Um, I'd love to do that. One more thing I want to mention about competition is that um, the, the predictions of the model in general, uh, so they work without competition. All we need to do is for the firm to have some bargaining power and ability to scale down. Uh, in banking, for example, it would be moving assets off balance sheet. Right? Um, and that will give banks uh, bargaining power. So, so theoretically, you don't need competition for this to work. Now, because we think that our regressions sort of uh, control this uh, uh, charter shopping, for, for this charter shopping effect, what we think we're picking out is the effect now of the uh, competition effect. So that's why we sell it, so that, that's why we speak of this as a general, uh, general effect. Great. So one question I had, or a couple points I have for you is that when I think of the, the way you structured the basic optimization model, um, so OCC and OTS were both um, self-funded organizations and, and they, they weren't appropriated by Congress. But at the same time, Congress acts as a monitor over the behavior of OCC and OTS. They can bring a lot of pressure to bear if they don't feel they're performing up to whatever standards they, they believe are appropriate. And so I'm wondering if bringing in the role of a monitor into the optimization problem might be an interesting way to extend the model a little bit in a way that kind of resonates with the way I think that, that work works. And the second point I have is have you thought about, in the context of the, your estimation, so the political regime, right? So if you think about Republican president is going to appoint the heads of these organizations, Democratic president, same thing, you're gonna find that depending on what time you're in, you're going to find that maybe there's an emphasis on regulation and it's very pro-regulation, or you want to deregulate. So how, how does that actually affect some of the ways you want to think about the modeling? These are great comments. So, so uh, about the uh, Congress and other things, uh, other, other bodies monitoring, right now it's in the cost function. So, so risk is costly for the bank. And so this is how we very reduced for and That's how we introduced this into the model. Uh, as I said, we worked with more general preferences and we saw you know, a lot more math, but more or less the same insight. Um, about political regimes, we didn't even think about it and we will now. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, you know, any, any kind of uh, variation like this could be useful for us because it will actually improve power. Uh, even, even though you're speaking the same. Uh, thanks for this comment. Other questions, comments? Okay, thank you all for coming.